I actually love the church. I grew up in the family. Well, we all love the church. But my parents, they didn't grow up in families that loved the church. In fact, they both grew up in families where maybe, just maybe, went to church twice a year. You know those two times, Easter and Christmas. Maybe that's your story. But when my dad came back from Vietnam, my mom and dad moved to Southern California. It was a friend that invited them to church. And it was, well, a church that my parents discovered who Jesus was. It was that church where they started to learn about how God had designed marriage and what a, a God-centered, loving marriage looked like. It was that church where they learned how to parent like God had designed parents to, to love and, and, and disciple their kids look like. It was that church that everything started to shift. And as I grew up, it was that church where I started to, well, discover Jesus. It was this church where I, I discovered how God had wired me and, and, and breathed his passion into me and his gifts into me. It was that church where I started to discover the power of well, community and togetherness. I love the church with all my heart. But I also know that the church can be extremely messy, right? Have you ever been part of a messy church? I mean, if you've ever gone to church, you know it's messy. And Jesus was so, so, well, he was so on point because Jesus understood that when he launched the church, that there was going to be a battle to try to stop the church. You see, there's... There's some devilish schemes happening. It's a spiritual war, you know, in the, the heavenly realms being waged to try to stop this movement that we now call the church. In fact, in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, hey, hey, I'm going to build my church. And that's an important phrase. It's not my church to build or your church to build. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. And he goes, and nothing's going to overcome it. And in fact, he goes, and the gates of Hades will never overcome it. But built into that well, passionate statement is something we have to recognize. That maybe these devilish schemes, this spiritual attack, this, well, the gates of Hades, maybe, maybe it'll never overcome it. But it doesn't mean it's not going to try to attack it. It doesn't mean that it's not going to try to distract it. And the two of the biggest devilish schemes out there that really, well, does it work on the church? Or these two? The first one is this, darkness. Another way to word that is sin. I mean, your sin and my sin. That's why I do the church, a gathering of people is messy. Why? Because, well, we're all people and we're all messy, broken, sinful people. And our sin, my sin gets a splatter all over you and your sin gets splatter all over me. And our sin together gets splatter all over everyone else. But Jesus said that he's a light and that he came to illuminate the world and that when the church went into motion, we are the light carriers, which is Jesus to illuminate this dark world. He said that's a message of hope. That's a message of love. That's a message of forgiveness and reconciliation. You see, within our own mess, our own sin, Jesus has given us how to forgive each other and love each other Reconcile with each other. Redeem broken relationships together to illuminate our dark world. The second devilish scheme that just completely wreaks havoc within the church is disunity. And you see, we as a church have to stop fighting with each other. And we got to start fighting for each other. I mean, I remember as a fourth, fifth grader, sitting in Sunday night church. My dad's standing on stage. He was an elder at the church. He's standing next to the, the senior, the lead pastor, and they had made a decision that felt like such a simple decision as a fourth and fifth grader. But they made a decision, and all of a sudden, in the middle of Sunday night church, people are standing and screaming. I mean, screaming. I, I, I can see this moment like it was yesterday. In fact, one of the people screaming was my piano teacher. I mean, this small little frail lady, and she's yelling and screaming, and spit is flying. And well, what, what, was that, what was that horrific decision that the leadership had made? Well, they decided to put the words 
from the hymnal on a screen. That was the decision. Instead of looking in a book to sing, now you could look up and sing looking on a screen. I'll never forget that moment because I didn't understand what the big issue was. But if you've ever gone through a church going through a war like that, Again, they're devilish schemes to distract and to attack. But remember, Jesus said, nothing's going to overcome the church. Why? Because the church is the vehicle, the strategy that God set in motion to share the good news about Jesus with everyone. And we see this, this movement, the ecclesia, what we now call the church, come alive with all of God's power and purpose and passion. And that's why the church is alive to this day. And we can read about the launch and the the, the surge of the church in this book called Acts, uh, A-C-T-S. A guy named Luke who wrote the Gospel Luke, the story of Jesus, also wrote the the, the start, the launch of the church, and the growth of the church. He wrote both of these works, which is so powerful to, to understand what Jesus was teaching, and all of a sudden what Jesus started into motion. And right towards the beginning of Acts, in Acts chapter 2, there's kind of like the, the cliff notes part of the entire book, or you could say the big idea, the core idea, the thesis of the entire book. You can read it in Acts chapter 2, starting... Well, in verse 42, and he writes, they, and they were those who had placed their faith, their trust in Jesus. He goes, they devoted. Now, that word devoted is one of those words we've got to camp uh, camp out on because, well, some 2,000 years ago, what Luke intended that word to kind of, will feel like to to reflect the image that he was trying to to paint for us to understand. It has shifted over, well, 2,000 years. The English word is devoted, but it doesn't quite do it justice. And we get, this happens to us all the time, right? Words kind of start to shift over time. In fact, right now today, uh, we carry around a phone that we don't really use as a phone anymore. I mean, every once in a while we might call someone, but we use it to text and to, to, to uh, post on social media and to take pictures and watch movies and play games. I mean, our phones do so much more than just, well, be a phone. And think about just 20 years ago, what could a phone do and not do? In fact, I think about my childhood. I, I'll never forget where all of a sudden one day my parents came home with a phone that didn't have a cord attached to the wall. It was a phone that had a really long antenna. And now I could walk around the house and talk to someone. You see, phone has changed. And 2,000 years ago, when, when, when Luke sat down and he said, they devoted, the ancient Greek word that he wrote down was the word prosecutorio. And prosecutorio is actually two separate Greek words that got slammed together. The first word, pros, means moving towards a goal or direction. Right? This is just classic goal setting, goal setting, strategy setting. Right? Here's where we want to go together. This is the direction. Hey, let's all go. Let's all move towards that common pursuit, that common reality, that common goal. That's what pros mean. The, the second word, kateria, means prevailing strength and power that we're going to come up against some obstacles, some devilish schemes, that there's going to be roadblocks, but we can prevail with strength and power. So as I looked at those two separate Greek words, again, that got slammed together, that, well, they translated into devoted, I simply wrote this one phrase, move with prevailing power. You see, when Luke sat down to write this, well, thesis statement of the entire book of Acts. He said, they devoted. They moved with prevailing power because they understood that nothing could overcome the movement of the church. And so they devoted. They moved together with prevailing power. And then he writes for us four kind of foundational components of that first church. Now, this isn't some exhaustive list. This isn't like just the only things the church should do. But these four things we must do. We must keep our focus. We must move together with prevailing power around these four things. Like we can't lose sight of these four things. 
The first thing that, that Luke tells us is that they move together with prevailing power, right? Because of the, the apostles' teaching. Now, the apostles had a very unique role. They were, they were people that were walking with Jesus. They were people that Jesus had poured into, Jesus had taught, Jesus had just emptied himself into them. And now they were the bridge. Jesus had left this world to go prepare a place. One day he'll come back. Jesus had set into motion this strategy. We now call the church, they called it the ecclesia, the, the assembly, the, the gathering on mission with God. And they were to help launch the church and guide the early formation of the church. In fact, our New Testament is now filled with letters from the apostles that help us understand what the church should be all about. What Jesus had called the church to do, to live, to love, to lead like him. And so that's why we anchor everything we do into Scripture. And my challenge for you is every decision you should anchor into Scripture. Does that reflect the Scripture? Does that reflect God's blueprint, uh, God's plan? Like, are you anchoring every decision, every thought, your prayer? I mean, the Bible must be that tool, that text, that guides every decision, and to help take capture every thought that all of us have. Is the Bible the anchor to you? Is it the rudder in your life? The second foundational component of the, the first church is a fellowship. Now that word, sometimes it gets regular, uh, 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 simplified into this idea of just hanging out. But it was so much more than that. You see, the idea that Luke was trying to convey was, yes, it's relationship. Yes, it's community. Yes, it's togetherness. All of that is true. It must start there, but it was more. It was almost like relationship plus. You see, he chose this word that meant uh, sharing something with someone or sharing with someone something. You see, it was selfless living. It wasn't just, hey, high five, we're friends, yay. But it's like, I'm going to look at the other person. I'm going to give of myself to that person, whether it's encouragement. I'm going to give encouragement to other people, or maybe it's material possessions. Hey, I know you have a need, and I can help you with that need. But it was always thinking about the other person. I'm going to share something that I have with someone. That was the idea of fellowship. It was selfless living. The third thing, breaking of bread. They just ate together. That's what they did. They ate together. There's something powerful, unifying, isn't there, about a meal together. Coming out of 2020, uh, there's a whole host of, of decisions we made, you know, in 2020 and, and, and on lockdowns and COVID and all of that. And as we're coming out, we're trying to, again, make wise decisions in a season of life that, you know, no one had ever lived or led uh, through before. And um, one of those decisions uh, in 2020 is we stopped donuts at all of our churches. So when we opened our churches back up, we didn't have donuts. And there was a couple reasons for that, actually two reasons specifically. One, uh, the reason was we just didn't know, again, at that moment three years ago, if a bunch of people licking their fingers and grabbing donuts and touching other donuts was the safest things. We didn't, just didn't know. The other component was, well, donuts are expensive. It takes money, and financially, it was a difficult, it's been a difficult season. I mean, for all churches, it's been a difficult financial several years. And donuts cost a lot of money. And so we're just like, let's just not bring them back yet. Many of you asked about them. And we're like, hey, we're, you know, we're discussing it, we're discussing it. But internally, we're like, quickly, we, we got the, well, should we? Yeah, maybe, I don't know, but do we, can we afford it? Well, also in a, at a meeting, I, someone asked a very specific question. She asked this question. She goes, if... If finances weren't an issue, what's one thing you would bring back? What's one thing you would start again? And I'm talking in milliseconds, me and one other person, we said the same thing. We said donuts. And I think about that moment a lot because I'd never thought about that question and I never I mean, thought about the answer. I mean, we're talking milliseconds. She asked such a thought-provoking leadership question and at the same time, in milliseconds, we both, well, 
We both said the same answer, donuts. So we made the decision across all of our churches to bring donuts back. And this is what we discovered immediately. You see, before the donuts, uh, when they were missing, people would get to church right on time or late, and right when church was done, they left. That's what was happening in our lobbies. And as soon as donuts came back across our churches, people started to come to church early. And after church, they hung out in our lobbies. Laughter started to fill our lobbies. Kids laughing and running and screaming. And by the way, we love that. We love kids loving to come to church. We love that kids want to come to church. We love when kids are being kids in church. Because we want kids to love church. And all of a sudden we discovered, when we brought donuts back, our lobbies came back to life. You see, there's something spiritual about breaking bread together. There's something uniting. When you sit down and have a meal together, there's something that God does in that supernatural, that spiritual space that connects people together. That's why we have donuts at our church. It's why we have coffee at our churches. It's why it's important to have a meal together as a family and with friends. And the fourth component, they prayed. Prayer was a go-to action for that first church. You see it over and over and over again. In fact, in part three, we're going to focus in on, well, this go-to action of the, well, the early church prayer. Luke goes on and says, everyone, everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Why? Because God was on the move. God was doing something significant. God, I mean, they could just see God working within this newly formed gathering of people on mission with God. And Luke tells us that all, all the believers were together and had everything in Common. Why? Because they were devoted. They were moving with prevailing power and strength to a common goal. That, that was to, to share Jesus with everyone. In fact, they were so devoted that they sold property and possessions to give to anyone as they had need. I mean, generosity erupted from within this very first church. I mean, in fact, generosity is just a sign of a Christ follower. That when you realize what Jesus has given to you, you want to respond in an act of worship to give back. Uh, Maybe you've heard this story. Maybe you, uh, in fact, witnessed this. I know some of you are still disturbed by this. Some of you can't believe I actually did this. I've heard people say, I can't believe you, Chris, the city boy, did this. But um, I kissed a pig. I kissed a pig, uh, and yes, this is disturbing. Uh, yes, you can watch the video of it. This is actually a screenshot from it. If you stare at this uh, picture long enough, you'll be able to see the snot running down the side of the pig's mouth. And I'm pretty sure this pig, whose name was Betty, um, is smiling. Um, yeah, it's disturbing. But we did this, why? We, well, we like to have fun here at TCC. I mean, if you've been around any length of time, we, just, we think church should be fun. We think church, church should be filled with joy and happiness and life and passion. And so we like to have fun. But more than that, we want to help get every student, every child to camp possible. And generosity erupted. So many of you just gave generously to help send kids to camp. And this is why this is so important. Our kids are students. Yes, they are the church now. But one day, and that day is going to come quickly, we're going to hand the baton of leadership off to our students and our kids. My question is, are we handing the church off better than it was handed off to us? Are we just going to look at them one day and say, good luck, good luck. It's in shambles, good luck. You see, do you have a giving plan for your local church? 
Do you? This is a, this is a real pointed question. Do you have a giving plan to resource the church now and to position it for our teenagers and our kids for generations to come? Have you committed to God a percentage? Have you said to God, hey, once a month or twice a month or every week, God, I'm going to give you because I believe that your church is the vehicle that you set in motion to tell all people about Jesus. Do you have a giving plan? If you do, I just want to high five you, celebrate you, and you just, you know, you know what God does within you when you live a generous life. You already know that. I don't have to, you're experiencing, experiencing it now. If you haven't, taking the step to have a giving plan. I want to encourage you to do that now. Don't wait. Now. Develop a giving plan. In fact, I hope that every time you see a pig, you think to yourself, I uh, I need a giving plan. I hope every time you eat bacon, you think to yourself, I need a giving plan. I hope every time you see a plate of pork nachos or eating a Christmas ham, you think to yourself, hey, I need to have a giving plan to support my church. Why? Because the church is a vehicle, the strategy God sent in motion to tell all people about Jesus. I just hope every time you think about me kissing a pig, you now think to yourself, do I have a giving plan? Why? Because the church is a big deal. Because because God has placed the message of Jesus, the hope of the world, into our hands, the church, a gathering of people on mission with him. If you don't have a giving plan, get one. Get one. Get one. Luke tells us that every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts. They continue to, to gather together. And this is another important one. I mean, commit to the gathering. Commit to coming to church together. My parents, they committed, and we didn't miss much church as a child growing up. I mean, but church became such a special place for me. Why? Because they, they committed to come together. Have you ever found yourself sitting in a church service? Don't show hands. I mean, unless you just want to. But have you, have you ever found yourself sitting in a church service and you thought to yourself as you're leaving, well, that's a waste of time? I, it's a real question. Now, maybe you say it different. Maybe it's something like, well, that just didn't connect or that message or Chris, I don't know what he's talking about or I didn't like that song or, or it was just too cold or I don't know why they do that. Or, there's a whole list of things, but it gets connected into this thought. Well, that just wasn't for me. I just didn't like it. And that was just a waste of time. On vacation this summer, my family, we went to church together. And uh, we found a church. It was a church I kind of heard about. We got up Sunday morning, got dressed, right, got in the car together. And this doesn't happen often. Why? Because, well, I'm usually well, speaking on Sunday morning. So for us to go to church together, it was kind of a special thing. We drove to the church. We parked. We walked in, got our coffee and made our way into the church service. I found myself during the message just, well, thinking to myself, well, this is a waste of time. I mean, the message was all over the place. It was disconnected. I couldn't follow the person. I mean, it was just, and I started getting frustrated. I'm like, well, great. The Sunday I get to sit here in church, like, I, this is just a waste of time because the message wasn't connecting with me. And I felt it growing and growing and growing. And then all of a sudden, the, the, the person giving the message, they, they, they started to pray. And I felt to myself, well, finally, he's done. And all of a sudden, they had this kind of response time where they invited people to come to different stations. And you could write a prayer and put it on the cross. Or you could take communion. Or, or you could light a candle that represented praying for someone. And so all of a sudden, people got up and started moving. Well, two chairs down from me was a younger lady, probably late 20s, early 30s. She had gotten to church somewhere between 15 to 20 minutes late. In fact, when she sat next to me, uh, I was like, I mean, the message had just started. That's how late she was. But when people started to move for the response, she actually stood up and made her way down the stairs to 
one of these stations that were at the end of the section we were sitting in. And I just watched her. She walked up to one of the candles and grabbed a little stick and she lit the stick on fire and she lit a candle. And right when she lit a candle, she started to wipe tears from her eyes. And that's when God just backhanded me. I mean, just God screamed within my soul, Chris, maybe the message wasn't for you. Maybe it was for her. I look down the row and I'm looking at my family and God smacked me again. I said, Chris, maybe the message wasn't for you. Maybe it was just you sitting in church and going to church with your families, what you needed. I got done worshiping. The service came to a close. I started walking downstairs and again, God had smacked me twice at this point. I was like, okay, enough, God, I get your point. And all of a sudden, there's a commotion, a gathering of people out on the patio. And, and I walked out on the patio, and all of a sudden, there was a baptism taking place. And I stood there and watched a, a, a brother and a daughter, two younger kids, getting baptized. And one by one, as they came out of the water, they, well, they ran up to mom and dad that were sitting on the edge. And I watched mom and dad hug their kids, and God smacked me a third time and said, Chris, maybe that wasn't for you. I walked in the bookstore, and I'm just exhausted at this point because God just keeps smacking me. And I'm walking through the bookstore, and all of a sudden on the shelf, I see my sister's book, and I snapped a picture, and I sent a text to her just to encourage her. And God's like, you see, Chris, maybe church today was about those other moments. You see, my encouragement for you is this. Maybe when you hear a song, maybe that song's not for you. It's for the person sitting next to you. Maybe when you hear a message that doesn't really connect with you, it's for another person who's sitting somewhere in the room with you. Maybe the next time you walk into church and you're like, I I just don't know why I'm here. Maybe God is saying to you, well, smile at someone, encourage someone, walk up, put your arm around someone. Maybe God has you at church, not for what the church can give you, but what God wants to do in you and through you to someone else. Remember, the church is a gathering of people. You see, maybe it's just about committing and saying, God, I'm going to show up. I have no idea what you want for me today, but I'm going to show up. Why? Because, God, you want to do something in me and through me. And then Luke writes, Every day they continued to meet together in their temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people and And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being, and this is the key word, saved. Daily, those being saved. Have you ever thought to yourself, I don't like big churches? In fact, maybe for you, coming to TCC, that was a stretch because it's a big church. Have you ever thought to yourself, maybe you've said, or maybe you've heard someone else say, I don't... I just don't like mega churches. It's an, it's an interesting topic that I hear in different circles. I read online. I read on social media. Just Christ followers banging on big churches, mega churches. And again, I mean, big churches have problems. But guess what? Small churches have problems. Mega churches have problems and are messy. Same thing with small churches. It's not about the size of the church. It's just, well, us people are messy. And our pursuit has never been about being a big church or a mega church. You've got to know that. Our pursuit is to reach everyone we possibly can with the message of Jesus, to scatter seeds. I mean, Jesus builds his church. Jesus grows his church. I mean, we're, we're just called to, to, to carry the message of hope, Jesus, to scatter those seeds everywhere we can. You see, we want to be hyper-focused on the one, the individual, to walk with, to pray for to help spiritually grow. I mean, that's, it's about the one. But we as a church want to be outward facing. And that's why every is so important. The gravitational pull of every church is towards insiders. It just is. The gravitational pull of every church is well, towards Christians. But the church was never designed to be insider focused. It was always designed to be outsider. People who don't know Jesus, people who aren't connected to Jesus, people who are living in darkness and they need to experience a hope that comes from the light of the world. 
And so we want to be a church that walks with everyone, but we want to be focused to, to the every, to every person who doesn't know Jesus, every person running away from God. And that's why the early church is so important. And Luke goes, hey, every day someone was coming to faith, turning their faith to Jesus, being saved. In fact, Luke takes a lot of time throughout the entire book of Acts to tell us the growth of the church. It went from 120 to 3,000, 5,000. I mean, these are big church. This is a mega church. I mean, and rapid growth of those being saved. But Luke didn't stop there. Again, throughout the whole book of Acts, the story of the church, he wrote phrases like more and more, numbers increasing, increased rapidly, increased in numbers, great number of believed, spread and flourish, grew daily. I mean, these are all phrases that Luke said, hey, the church must grow. Why? Because everyone needs to know who Jesus is because Jesus changes lives. And the church, the gathering of messy people, is the vehicle that God set in motion to share that good news, the message of Jesus, with everyone. You see, God is absolutely on the move. He's moving. I know maybe you've read reports and studies about the decline of the church in the United States. I I read all of them. I I get it. But here's what I know. God's on the move. Will Will you move with him? Because Jesus is clear that nothing is going to stop the church. Nothing is going to overcome the church. Are you going to move with them? And as we move, let's move with prevailing power. And in part two of move, we're going to look at this power that God, through Jesus, infused the church with. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for what you're doing in your church in your messy, broken (laughs) church filled with people trying to reflect your son, Jesus. Lord, I just pray that we are an outside-facing church understanding that we carry the light to illuminate the dark world. Lord, I pray that we will move together in unity. We will fight for each other, not with each other. Because we have a message of hope. in our communities, our families, our coworkers, our friends desperately need to know the love of Jesus. Hope that he brings us. In your name I pray.